that if you see any kind of transgression, if you see something that goes wrong, speak up, do something, because without, you know, you're getting involved. You don't have to be a hero, but without you, not, but without you getting involved, things can only get worse. By being involved and by speaking up, I think things will only, only can get better. Well, try to be open, try to accept people, try not to be prejudiced about somebody who thinks differently. Respect people who are different, because almost everyone is different from you. All of us, young or old, need to listen to their own conscience, their own. That's, you, know, you probably, when you have a choice, you probably know what is the better one. Usually it's the harder one, that's the better one. But listen to your own conscience. First advice is don't hate, because hate is a virus. Hate will destroy you. Others may hate you, but they don't win until you hate them back. However, most important thing is that I believe very strongly one person can make a difference. Don't be indifferent when you see injustice being done to fellow human being. Because I'm alive today because of one person willing to risk her life and that's the reason I'm around. And the final thing is, never, never give up hope. The most important thing is to appreciate what you have. And to appreciate what you have, go read about books, how it is in other country. Pay attention even to the news. There are people who are still hungry, hungry today, who have no home, they are homeless. Millions of them. And think about them, not just about yourself. You know, Victor Frankl said, the meaning of life is only if you do something for somebody else, not just for yourself. And there's so much you can do. Look around. And when you know how to appreciate, you are going to have a happier life. And, and try not to hate. And try to be involved with other people, with other societies. And, you know, do your best. That's all we can do. Do your best and respect. Welcome, and thank you for joining us. I'm Dee Simon, the CEO of the Holocaust Center for Humanity. Today marks a somber day, Holocaust Remembrance Day known as Yom HaShoah. On this day, we recognize the systematic state-sponsored persecution and murder of six million Jews by the Nazi regime and its allies and collaborators during World War II, and the killing of millions of others who were considered politically, racially, or socially unfit. The Holocaust was an extreme that we can barely imagine, so mind-boggling that the temptation to forget and repress it are real. But we remember. We remember because it's a scar on humanity. We need to understand what humans are capable of. As we honor those who were killed, those who survived, and those who saved them, we contemplate our obligations to the living. The current war in Ukraine marks this year's remembrance particularly poignantly. We are reminded of the Holocaust as we watch women and children hide. People fleeing their homes with only a small suitcase, killing, rape, and wanton destruction by the Russian army. These are war crimes. As the Holocaust Museum, we are the bearers of history. Our mission is to protect the truth through our artifacts, stories, and education. Today, the Russian government is doing more than distorting the true history of the Holocaust. They are using this history to establish a narrative that justifies war and the killing of innocent people. This kind of absence of reality reminds us of the lies and misinformation spread by the Nazis about the Jewish people, lies that eventually 
led to the murder of millions. Our obligation is to bear witness to what is happening in Ukraine, to fight for the truth, and to call upon governments across the world to do more to stop these atrocities. In the months and years ahead, we will fight to reform the United Nations, pursue justice through war crime investigations, and support the charges of crimes against humanity. In the years ahead, we will debate on whether this horror should be called a genocide. And we will teach our children about the fragility of peace. On this Yom HaShoah, our responsibility is to remember those who were killed in the Holocaust, those whose lives were ravaged. Our obligation now is to seek peace and justice for the living. It's now my honor to introduce Rabbi Shimon Benzikane, Rabbi of Congregation Ezra Becerath. Rabbi Benzikane served as a rabbi in London and Venezuela before coming to Seattle. He currently serves as a member of the Executive Council of the Sephardic Rabbis. I decided this evening to quote my dear colleague of blessed memory, Rabbi Jonathan Sack, the Chronoli Bracha. We studied together in England, Jewish college, under the leadership of our dearly beloved Rabbi Nahum Rabinovich of blessed memory, who was the chief rabbi of Malea Dumim in Israel. At that time, um, Rabbi Nahum Rabinovich was the principal of Jewish college. Rabbi Jonathan Sack was in the same class with me, but he was also a brilliant professor of philosophy there who taught me philosophy. And this is what he said. Uh, the Holocaust has become more than a Jewish tragedy. It has become for the West the defining symbol of man's inhumanity to man. Some Jews oppose this, but they are wrong. He said, there is a difference between Jewish and general remembrance of the Holocaust. For us, it is a grief observed. We remember that two thirds of the Jews of Europe, among them a million and a half children were shot, gassed, burned and turned into ashes, or in some cases buried alive. The greatest tragedy of a tear stained history. We remember whole communities of Jews from Sweden in the North to Greece in the South, from France in the West to Russia in the East, people who were no conceivable threat to anyone who vanished into the black hole in the heart of Europe. Among them were families who had lived in certain land for almost thousand of years, and yet they found they were still regarded as strangers without the most basic of human right, the right to life. The Holocaust was more than a Jewish tragedy. It was a human tragedy. Auschwitz did more than claim the life of its victim. Sometime of the something of the image of God, that is humankind died there too. That's why everyone must remember where the rail track of hatred end. There is one mistake we must never make, namely to think that the victim of persecution are its cause. There was a time when Jews believed that they could cure anti-Semitism. Were they not hated because they were different? Well, then they would make every effort to become the same. One by one, they abandoned the distinctive feature of Jewish life. They integrated, acculturated, assimilated, but anti-Semitism did not end. If anything, it grew. Those who hate need no reason to hate. Jews were attacked because they were rich and because they were poor. They were condemned as capitalists and also as communists. Voltaire accused them of being primitive and superstitious. Others call them ruthless cosmopolitan. Anti-Semitism was protein and logic defying. It exists in countries where there are no Jews. And that is why Holocaust remembrance must not be confined to Jews alone. The victim cannot cure the crime. That demands the rule of law, the respect for justice, and a constant effort of education. And that's why I admire Mr. Henry Friedman and the, the Holocaust Center for Humanity who really take care about educating people. The imperative of remembrance never ends. Bosnia, Kosovo, Rwanda, Chesnia, Northern Ireland, and the Middle East, all these and many others are our reminder that ethnic and religious conflict still scar our world. Holocaust Remembrance Day does not imply that the Shoah was the only tragedy of modern history. To the contrary, it reminds us that unchecked, Hatred can take many forms and claim many kinds of victims. 
our best defense is not abstract principle, but specific memory, the knowledge of what happened once and must never happen again. This is what um, Elie Wiesel said, the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifferent. The opposite of art is not ugliness, it is indifferent. And the opposite of faith is not heresy, it is indifferent. And the opposite of life is not death, it is indifferent, indifferent between life and death. And I'll, and I'll conclude with what Martin Neumler said. In Germany, they came first for the communists, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a communist. Then they came for the Jews, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a Jew. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a trade unionist. Then they came for the Catholics, and I didn't speak up because I was a Protestant. And then they came for me, and by that time, no one was left to speak up. My friend, this is in remembrance of the Holocaust. For all those who survived, we need to speak up wherever injustice lies there. Thank you so much, Rabbi Bensikin, for being with us for this program. Rabbi Bensikin will join us again at the end of the program for a blessing. I would now like to invite our candle lighters to please turn on their cameras if you haven't yet. Um, Steve and Beverly, if you are able to accept the panelist invitation, you'll be able to turn on your camera. In memory of the six million Jewish people and millions of others who were murdered in the Holocaust by the Nazis and their collabor collaborators, we light candles to bring light into the darkness and to remember the individuals. Our candle lighters today are descendants of Holocaust survivors. They light candles in memory of their families and for all of those who have no family to light candles for them. We take a moment of silence while they light their candles now. Thank you to our candle lighters, Felice Orlitz, Steve Cohn, Jessica Fenton, Barbara West, Thomas Heller, Linda Oppenheimer Krischer, Noam Schaefer, Marie Stromberg Warjik, Liliana Ratelny, Lori Newman Weiner, Andrea DeSaro, and Beverly Silver. Thank you so much to all of you. When we think of the Holocaust, it's hard to understand the scope of it. We say six million Jewish people were murdered, but how do we understand six million? This is one six million times. 1.5 million of these individuals were children, two thirds of the Jewish population in Europe, centuries of history wiped out by the Nazis and their collaborators. With us today are three survivors. All three were children from three different countries and all three survived in part because they were helped by non-Jewish people. I would like to introduce each of them to you. Peter. When Pete was a young kid, he used to love playing with toy trains. Or so he thinks because of this wonderful photo taken of him on his balcony in Amsterdam. In truth, Pete doesn't remember his life before he went into hiding on a farm. Pete was six years old living in Amsterdam when the order came from German authorities that all Jews must register themselves. Approximately 159,000 Jewish people registered, including Pete and his family. Less than a year later, the Nazis used this information to forcibly send Jews to labor and death camps, primarily to Sobibor and Auschwitz. Only 5% would survive these camps. Thousands of Dutch Jews went into hiding to avoid being sent to camps. Hiding was terribly risky for everyone involved and there were endless threats from raids to lack of food to informants. The majority of the Dutch Jews who went into hiding managed to survive and one of those was Pete. Susie. Susie as a child loved her father's small open-faced sandwiches. He would make them in the afternoons when they would gather with other Czech survivors and refugees in the United States. 
Susie was only three years old when the Nazis took control of her hometown in Karlsbad, Czechoslovakia. In 1938, the Nazis demanded control of this area called the Sudetenland, which had a large ethnic German population. In exchange for giving the this territory to Germany, Hitler promised not to wage war in Europe. Obviously, this pledge was broken by Hitler. It did not take long for Susie's father to determine that life was about to get worse for Jewish people, and he made the bold decision to leave his home, his extended family, and his country. Approximately 350,000 Jewish people lived in Czechoslovakia. Two thirds of them were murdered in the Holocaust by the Nazis. Susie and her immediate family found safety, but not without hardships and threatening close calls. Our third panelist today is Henry. Henry loved Saturdays when his family would gather in their living room and share stories and cookies. It was the Sabbath and Henry's large extended family would come and go throughout the day. He remembers walking to the synagogue and even before getting there, he could hear the choir. After the Holocaust with the synagogue in ruins, he would go and sit near the synagogue. In his mind, he could still hear the choir. Brody, which is currently part of Ukraine near Lviv, was Henry's home. Brody was a Jewish town, one of the oldest in the Western part of Ukraine. After World War I, Brody became part of Poland. And in 1939, more than half of the population of Brody was Jewish. When the Germans invaded Brody in 1941, persecution of Jews escalated quickly. Within three years, the entire Jewish community of Brody would be wiped out by the Nazis. Of the 10,000 Jewish people who lived in Brody before the war, less than 100 would survive the Holocaust, less than 100. One of them is Henry Friedman, who was a young teenager at the time. So many people want to forget the past and it's difficult to share painful memories. Pete, Susie and Henry, I wanna start by asking all of you, why do you share these stories? And maybe Susie, you can start us off with this question. Um, we share these stories because these dear ones who met their horrible fates can never be forgotten. And um, it would be a tragedy if they were forgotten. And when I go to speak um, to these wonderful students, it's wonderful at that moment in time, they remember their names, they listen very carefully, they ask wonderful questions, and that is one way they are remembered. Of course, they're remembered by our families, but it's so nice to have um, these wonderful students remember them. How about you, Pete? How, why, why do you continue to tell these stories? My message is that of independent thought. It is only too often that we go along with the flow, not always our beliefs. The world as we have created it is a product of our thinking. It can't be changed without changing our thinking. I found a, a quote from a philosopher, a gentleman by the name of Karl Popper in the early 20th century. And I often with the youngsters, I have to repeat it because you got to actually listen to the outcome of that. And that gentleman made a statement that I think is so, so important. That was maintaining a tolerant society we must be intolerant of intolerance. That just seems to make a lot of sense to me. And if people, the youngsters, especially that I have the pleasure of speaking to so many times, will just use independent thought and research and find the truth behind whatever they have been told or are thinking. Thank you, Pete. How about you, Henry? In 1983, I could not talk about the Holocaust. I could not talk about my experiences. Until I went to Washington, D.C., we decided to build a Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. 
And I read an article in the paper, it said the Holocaust never happened. And I turned to my wife, I said, if the Holocaust didn't happen, what happened to all my relatives? And I realized at that time that I cannot be silent any longer. And from then on, we, we decided to build a museum in Seattle. And because if we don't remember who's going to carry on that memory, and we cannot forget because this crime that was committed against the Jews is the most horrific and well-documented crime. And therefore, if we don't learn from that experience, people say history repeats itself and let's not that happen to anyone, to any nation, to any people and hatred is a crime by itself. So don't hate. And this is my message, do not hate. Thank you so much, Henry. So just so the audience knows here too, here's how we're gonna do this panel. I've tried to weave in as many of the questions that many of you submitted prior to the program. And we have uh, a question for each person going forward. Susie, I want to start with you. After Czechoslovakia was annexed and came under the control of Nazi Germany, your father made the decision to try to leave the country. What had he seen or experienced that made him feel that the worst was still to come? Well, after the horrors of Kristallnacht, it was um, apparent to my father that we needed to leave. Um, and he decided that we would go to a small town called Bardiaf, and it was a rural town. And if we settled in and were very quiet, um, this whole thing would go away and we could go back to our good life. But all of a sudden, the Czech people who previous to this, he felt very, very comfortable with, they were very assimilated. Now, all of a sudden, they wouldn't talk to him. They wouldn't um, have any help with any directions. They wouldn't help with any food or any of the necessities of life. Um, uh, during this trip, I developed whooping cough and no one, would, no one wanted a Jewish child around. They certainly didn't want one that was sick. And um, life changed just entirely different than they were used to. They were so assimilated before that. And um, it was then that my father went to Prague and he started working on the documents needed to leave. And that was a horrendous situation, but he persevered and did what he had to do. And I'd like to say something about my father. It's a little on the interesting side. He was the a spoiled one of the family. And of all the people to get his family out, you would not have chosen, of the brothers, you would have chosen one of the other ones. Um, he, he had been born with a club foot, and so his mother spoiled him a lot and tried to make life easy for him. And it's just interesting how he rose to the occasion where the others, um, well, for their own reasons, decided to stay. And, and that was very tragic for them, of course. And Susie, we just had a picture come up on the screen of the Rindler factory. Yes. And can, can you tell us what happened with the factory? Um, actually, it, um, it, it still was there after the war and it was taken over um, by the communists. And um, one time um, my daughters and I went to see about it and they were very, um, uptight that we came, you know, what do you want? You know, they're, they're afraid we were coming back to make trouble. All we wanted to do is see the place, but it was called Auto Avia and they um, customized trucks and they, they made uh, trucks available for the various businesses. They sold cars and, um, and it was a going, going business. 
And this, this was the factory owned by your family, correct? Yes. 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 It was quite well known in the community. And um, my, my grandfather, Richard Grindler, was very philanthropic because he did well. And um, he was a very philanthropic and well known mm -hmm. in the community. Great. Um, Pete, my next question is for you. One of your earliest memories was when your father was taken away by the Nazis. What do you remember of that day? Well, very specifically, it actually started all out when mom told me that uh, Aunt Katie and Uncle Leo have been arrested. I was six years old. What do you mean arrested? What does that mean? How do you explain that? How does an, how does an adult explain something like that to a child? Then the grandparents came, Oma and Opa were arrested. What do you mean arrested? Well, she pointed at some soldiers outside that had to do with them. And then came the day that mom was extremely upset. And she sat me down and told me that Papi, dad had been arrested. My dad had used to love to fish and he had a two man rowboat. And amongst the Nuremberg laws, a Jew could not own a boat if a two man rowboat, if you want to consider that a boat. He went fishing on one of the canals in Amsterdam. That was of course not allowed. And in June of 1942, he was arrested. And that was the last that we ever saw or heard of him again. It was after that event that mom contacted someone in the underground who found a place, some people that would be willing to shelter us. We're gonna to get to hear more about that story in a little bit. And Henry, in 1942, the Nazis forced the Jews of your beautiful town of Brody into a ghetto. And what did your family do? Well, my father took us to a farm that we worked on our own farm and we had a German manager. Uh, uh, he was half Polish, half uh, a German. And, uh, and my father went to him and said, listen, I know what to plant in my parcel of land. Why don't you let us help you with the planting? And uh, he went to the Gestapo and got his permission to stay outside the ghetto. In October of 1942, we came home I, with, from the fields and my father was called into the manager and the manager told him that tomorrow the police are coming to escort you to the ghetto. But my father, in the meantime, prepared two hideaway places with Christian families for me, my mother, my younger brother and a Jewish teacher that came to live with us right after Nazi occupation because Jews could not go to school. And my father didn't want me and my brother to fall too far behind in our education. He asked the Jewish teacher to come to live with us. And when time came into hiding, she became part of our family. And my father found space with another lady that took him in without telling her husband or two teenage sons that she was hiding my father in a barn. And uh, so that night, instead of going, being picked up the next morning to take him to the Brody ghetto, we disappeared from existence as far as the Germans were concerned. And uh, we found ourselves, myself, my brother, and my mom and the teacher up in a loft in a barn uh, above the animals. And uh, we spent 18 months in that place without being able to stand up. All I could do is just lay or sit. So finally, when I was liberated, in, as a matter of fact, in March, 14, 1944, 80, 
eight years ago. To me, this time of the year is a very precious time because in April, I was in a hospital with typhus. So it's like coming back to life, especially right now when I watch the news, what's happening about 100 kilometers from where I come from. I can't watch it because it brings terrible, terrible memories to me. Three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, Henry, we're going to get to hear more about your hiding place in a few minutes. Thank you. Pete, after most of your family was arrested and your mother knew you were not safe, what did she do? She contacted an underground individual. And those were individuals who just stated or his attitude were, who are these Germans coming across our border, taking our citizens away? And those people at the risk of their own lives would do things for the Jewish people, such as food, food stamps were given to all of the citizens in the Netherlands. Most of the food was controlled by the Nazis, by the soldiers, and the Jews weren't given any. So some of these underground people, resistance people, if you will, managed to get food. Falsification of papers, in case you were stopped that you were not on one of those lists. And more important probably than anything else, that they would in fact find people that would be willing to shelter a Jewish person or persons. And it was with that, that we left our apartment on the fourth floor on the Roosevelt lawn in Amsterdam and went to a small, small community in the province of Friesland where there were two courageous, courageous middle-aged people uh, non-Jewish to be sure, that would be willing to shelter mom and myself. And it was in this farm that mom and I spent almost two and a half years. On that farm, as there were other farms around, neither mom nor I could ever come outside during daylight hours. The reason was, of course, there were other farms in the area, and as in any other country, you have good, you have bad, you don't know who is who. And if mom or I were to ever come outside, somebody would say, hey, who are they? Uh -uh. We survived for two and a half years with no body, no, no soul. We did not exist except at dusk when it got dark but we come outside for some fresh air. But above all, it was these incredible, incredible people that worked their fingers to the bone without question to give us food. And not only did I realize how giving they were, but as I got older, I started to realize their courage because if for some reason, that not to be very unlikely, matter of fact, very likely that mom and or I were to get caught by the Nazis, both these dear people, Klaus and Rufino Post would be arrested with their entire family and sent to a Nazi concentration camp. Needless to say, I have very touching and warm feelings for these people every time I tell my story. Mm. Susie, when you were escaping Nazi-occupied Czechoslovakia, you were forced to hide briefly in Holland. You were just four and your sister was seven years old. What was this like? Um, my my uh, sister, Eva, and um, I, and my father, of course, and we, we were in an attic and um, we had to be very quiet. Um, during the day, my father would go out and get information as to what a family like of ours could do. And he was gathering information because 
it, we knew this was a short-term thing. Um, the woman had, had um, taken some jewelry from my mother in exchange for us staying up there. And um, we were in an attic and down below um, some uh, German sympathizers, the NS Bayers, came to accost the woman and they said, we have heard you are hiding Jews. And why would you want to help Jewish people? And we're saying all these terrible, horrible, awful things about Jewish people. And we understood them because they were all speaking German. My sister, who was seven at the time, um, knew very well that these were terrible, horrible, awful lies. And in her possession, she had some marbles. And she decided to shove the marbles through the cracks in the wall into the mashed potatoes. And with that, um, they said, well, we are gonna go back and get some reinforcements and we will come back and we will go through every bit of this house. And the minute they said that, of course, we had to leave. And um, that was our, our next stop was heading towards England. Your your sister was she was brave or bold. Well, <laughs> it was her it was her seven year old resistance. And mm -hmm. and why you can tell lies about us? Not true, not true. And up until now, um, up until all this was happening, we had the very nice life in Czechoslovakia. It was you know everything was fine until it wasn't. Mm -hmm. So. Henry, you were in hiding in this small attic in the barn for 18 months. And you started to tell us a little bit about what the space looked like and how you were in this space for almost the entire 18 months. What, what did you do to pass the time with four of you in this tiny, tiny loft? Well, fortunately for me, that my father had the wisdom to bring the teacher and she kept us going even some of the books that we brought but in our mind but even without books she would talk to us and kept us busy and the fact is part of the entertainment used to be because uh, we had a straw roof above us and uh, we would be counting straws in a space. And that kept us busy. You know, I would ask my brother, how many straws did you count? He said, 99 between this space. And I would say, you know, 50, whatever it is. But that was part of it. But what that did for us, it helped me when I was finally liberated, I was able to skip three years of schooling and start that school. Uh, fortunately, I was a very good student, so uh, things came easy for me. As a matter of fact, I was one of the youngest, but we were growing up before the war between my cousins. And uh, I was, they used to call me teacher's pet. <laughs> uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, the teacher would give me uh, papers of the students to correct their papers. So it was easy for me when I got out and luckily for me, because the space that we had, it was, I don't know how to describe it. All I could do is just see straw above me in a wall. But what happened, there was a plywood board in front of me and after a few days of darkness, because I had a little knife and I made a hole in the wood about the size of a silver dollar, that I was able to look through that hole. That was the opening for me to the outside. And I used to see storks nesting mm. on top of the roofs and they would fly away. And I was dreaming many times that I was the stork and was flying away. And then I would hear shotguns, guns firing, and that would wake me up. 
Why? You know, for all these years, my younger brother, to this day, he cannot speak about that hope space or that horror. You know, we as Holocaust survivors have seen things that no human eye should ever have to see or experience. And this is the reason many of us Holocaust survivors can talk about this. It took us many, many years to open up. And the reason we are talking now is because if we don't remember, if we don't carry on, history has a way of repeating itself. And this is the reason uh, that we talk. It's not easy to open up wounds. If anyone has any surgery, you don't want to talk about it. You rather really talk about the fun on the vacation. But I felt we had a mission, and the mission, because for years I had a difficult time, why did I survive and not the rest of my family? Because the only one to survive my total family is my brother, my mother and father, and one cousin. Everybody else was killed. So I had a difficult time, why did I survive? And finally, as you all know, I committed myself for the last 30 some years to tell the story. And the people that I tell, hopefully will repeat it because we cannot forget what happened in people, generation after generation after generation will have to tell the story. So that never, never ever happens to any other people in the world. Henry, I wish we were all in a room in person together so that we could all stand up and clap for all three of you who made this difficult and painful decision to come and continue to share these stories so that the rest of us could learn and hear them. I, I thank you on behalf of all of us who are here today. Um, so Pete, you also have a, a really remarkable story of being in hiding. And even though you were on a rural farm, you were not safe and people were still looking for Jews and coming to this farm and looking. How did you and your mom stay safe? Again, through the courage of the Post family, Klaus made a trap door in the piney uh, wooden floor. And when the Germans came looking, ransacking the farm, when we heard the trucks coming before they got there, mom and I would hide underneath the floorboard in the dirt of this old farm. And this farm was old. By the time we got there, it was probably already 40 years old. There was no plumbing. There was no toilet facilities. But even that got to be too dangerous. Klaus asked me to take a wheelbarrow and some shovels one day at dusk could not come out during the day. And right next to the farm, 150 feet or so, was a small group of trees, a small fort. Make a long story short, we dug a hole in the side of this cart class made like a cave. And every time that the Germans, the trucks came down, mom and I'd run out of the back of the farm and we would crawl into this hole, just side by side, hardly able to breathe. Class had made it in such a way with twigs in the front, it just blended in with the nature. But the two things that I remember above everything else, two frightening things when we laid there body to body. One, dirt always came trickling down. I was always afraid that it would cave in. But the thing that scared me more than anything else, I am going on seven years old now, I could hear the Germans ransacking the farm looking, but I couldn't see them through the hidden twigs of the cave. And the thing that scared me more than anything else is that this time they're gonna come and get me. What did I do? Where is dad? Where is grandma? What are we doing in this hole? It was so frightening because I could hear them, 
but I didn't know when they were coming. Well, the bottom line, of course, is I have the pleasure of talking to everybody here. They never did come into that forest. Pete, we actually have a photo, and Richard, maybe we can show this photo now of the cave when you went back in the 1990s was still there in the forest. Can you that, tell us about this picture? That was absolutely unbelievable. Not even knowing where the village was, where the farm was, through a lot of searching, I actually found it. And we went into this, my family, my son's daughter, uh, daughter-in-law and my wife and I went into that forest. And as we were walking through there, lo and behold, after almost 60 years, there was that cave. Of course, it didn't have the twigs in front anymore, but that was uh, just a surreal experience. That was the place that mom and I hid in. This is an actual photograph of the daughter of the people that saved me. And this was taken in the late 80s when she came to visit what was her parents' farm at that time, the small farm. And she too took a picture uh, in front of that. To see that particular cave hiding place, it brought back some incredible memories, needless to say. But to just to recognize the fact that after all these years that it was still there was just, just remarkable. I will never ever forget that scene. Yeah, it's incredible. It's incredible. It's a it's a reminder of how recent this history is that that the cave is still existing there in the forest. Susie, your family was lucky to have a sponsor in England who was willing to take your family in. What do you remember of this time in England and who who was this couple that you lived with? Well, the couple that we lived with were the Lord and Lady Carmeslow, and their family name was Fremantle. And the Lord and Lady Carmeslow had had some dealings with um, people in the Sudetenland with the Czech uh, crystal in China. So when this happened, and of course with the betrayal of Czechoslovakia by their Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain, they decided to do something. They went to the British Home Office and they asked the uh, people at the British Home Office to um, get them together with a family from the Sudetian Lamb, the western third of Czechoslovakia, and a family with small children. And that we were lucky, lucky, lucky that that was our family. Um, they lived in um, a wonderful manor house and they had small cottages um, around their, their yard. And we lived in one of those small cottages. And um, my dad became the Lord's chauffeur and he took him um, into the parliament and did whatever the, the Lord wanted him to do. And the Lord became very close to my dad. And he um, always called him Mr. Rindler because he said, I know you were never a chauffeur before and I'm, I'm, I want to treat you like one of us. And um, the, the lady uh, did everything she could for us. They were really the best of the best. And when the time came that my father, Rudy Rindley, who was a proud man, decided that he no longer wanted to be a chauffeur. He wanted to go and have a regular job. And then he decided that he would go to Oxford. Um, there was no work for him at Oxford. And so he went to London and um, Coventry to get work. And then he was caught in the terrible, horrible, awful bombings. And, um, but he fortunately did survive. And um, we also have had bombings in Oxford. And when we he would hear the air raid uh, siren, we would um, put on our, uh, we would sleep in our clothes and then we would put um, our, our masks and in our canisters and go down under and wait until the air raid uh, sign said for us that we could come back up. And um, it, it was, uh, the, the British were, were very good to us. 
And um, one thing that I want to say is when we decided to leave, the Lady Council wrote a five page um, letter, you know, to, to my mother about how wonderful we were and that anytime uh, we wanted, we could come back. And she said, remember my dear, if Oxford isn't just the right thing, you, there's always a welcome for you waiting at the old house. And this, they were just great. And, uh, and when my sister and I went to school in Oxford, the lady was sure that we wouldn't have the right clothes because you had to wear uniforms. And she came up and got us the uniforms. Wow. Um, prior to that, though, an interesting um, thing was that um, they baptized the Lord and they baptized my sister Eva and I into the Church of England. And they did that because if the Germany took over England and something happened to our parents, they were willing to adopt us. But we couldn't be Jewish children. We had to be um, Episcopal Church, Church of England children. And that's how I got my middle name, Margaret. Hmm. Hmm. Quite, a, quite a remarkable, remarkable couple. Yes, yes. Um, they were elderly and um, once and my sister was on a cruise and there were some people related to them on the cruise. And my sister asked some questions, but they were very standoffish because people always think when you start asking questions that you might want something from them. You know, all we wanted to do is just tell them how wonderful their relatives were. Pete, I wanna ask you another question about um about moving from one hiding place to the next since you didn't stay in one place the whole time. And at one point you and your mom are leaving a hiding place in The Hague for another hiding place in Amsterdam. How did you manage to move from one place to the next without being caught? I'll stay right up front to this day. I don't understand, I don't believe, I don't know how my mother ever came up with this, but the women that were giving us shelter started to get scared that we would get caught and that would be the end of them. We had to get back out of the city of The Hague, back to Amsterdam through the underground. The unfortunate thing was there was only one highway in those days connecting the two cities. No civilians allowed. It was strictly for German convoy. Somehow, one day I wake up at night, my mother is sitting at a table, a candlelight with a bunch of bed sheets, and she is sewing. After several hours, she ended up with a, making a uniform, a nurse's uniform, and we tippy-toed out of the apartment through the snow. I said, Mom, where are we going? She says, don't speak, Peter. By this time, I'm 10 years old, and as we get further, I said, Mom, we're not going to this highway, are we? She says, Peter, we got to get to Amsterdam. I said, mom, it's for the German soldiers. They're the ones that want to kill us. She says, don't speak. As we get close to the highway, we see German troops marching, tanks. And now my mother does something, as I always refer to, the doo-doo is going to hit the fan. She starts to hitchhike. It was just a few minutes, and a large flatbed truck stopped, and a SS officer gets out reading my mother the riot act. What are you doing, my the child? No civilians allowed, blah, blah, blah. Here was her story. She says, you know, the V2 rockets that the Germans used to fire to England, the uh, British used to come and bomb them. And she bombed the sites and she pointed at me and she says, see this little boy here? One of the British bombs hit his apartment and it killed his father and his mother, and I'm taking him to an orphanage to Amsterdam. Ach so! He grabbed my mother by the arm. I'm hanging to her for dear life. As we get to the flatbed truck, he separates me from my mother. He takes my mother and lifts her into the cab of the truck next to the German driver. He comes back to me. I don't know what's gonna to happen to me, but he lifts me up, puts me in the back of the truck, I am sitting in the snow by myself. This other Nazi officer gets into the cab. I'm sitting in the snow. Mom is sitting between the two SS officers 
and they took us to Amsterdam. They took us, mom fooled them. I get very excited every time I get, how did she ever come up with that? That basically the people that wanted to murder us took us where we wanted to go. It's, I, every time I get excited, I'm sorry. It's, I just can't get over how she could, how she ever came up with that kind of a plan. I can't believe she took the risk. I mean, she must have just been a remarkable, oh my gosh. a remarkable woman. Wow. Henry, I, I want to ask you about liberation, but before I do, I'm wondering if you would tell us a little bit about, um, because we received several questions about this, what did you eat when you were in hiding and how did people get the food to you since you were up in this attic in the barn? Well, you would originally, my father prepared food for six months for us. However, these people that took us in, they were not rich. They were poor people. They shared the food after three months. They cut us down to one meal. It would be a pot of soup they would be sent up to us at night and we would put it between our bodies to keep it warm so we could eat it the next morning. The lady never had to clean the pot because I had the privilege to lick every little drop of food that was still left. Because when we were liberated on March 14, 1944, I weighed 40 kilos. I was a skeleton. I couldn't walk. And uh, we were liberated by the Russian army. And uh, my father picked me up with some sticks as crutches. And uh, we found, because you see, Brody was for three months still held by the Germans, but we nine kilometers outside of Brody. We were in the Sukhovola in a village. We were liberated. By the time we got back three months in June to Brody, 70% of the city of Brody was destroyed. Every per building that we had was gone. The only thing that's left of our property there is still the land. But I got sick of typhus right afterwards. And uh, I was lucky. My mom found a Jewish doctor and he wouldn't let me die. He put me in a military hospital. And uh, once, which was in April of, I could say 88 years ago. And by the time I got out, the people knew how to make you walk because they had wounded soldiers had to put it back in the uh, on the front line so they forced me to walk and i tell you tears used to come to my face but they forced me to walk and i learned how to walk again because my muscles were all atrophied because i never left the place except for one time uh my message is I don't know if I have the time to say it, but I have to say it. I was lucky because one young Christian girl risked her life. She was 70 years old. My message, as you heard these Holocaust survivors or any survivors, we have risen from the ashes. We're sharing stories. That's very painful. It's not fun for us to tell, but we feel the necessity so we can help other humans in the future to learn from our experiences. We started from the bottom. We came to America. I didn't know the language, I didn't know a soul. Today, one block away from the place that I was staying in, I had a hotel, there's a place called the Holocaust, Henry Friedman Holocaust Center for Humanities Museum. So never, never give up hope because everything is everything possible. Learn from the Holocaust survivors. Don't just look for the blood and glory. 
learn from the positive thing that they, what they have accomplished without education, most of us, like my children, I never finished high school, but my children had college education. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Susie, I wanna come back to you for a moment. Um, only your immediate family was able to leave Czechoslovakia. What happened to the rest of the family? Well, unfortunately, um, Grand Grandpa Richard was dragged to Terezin. He perished there. Uh, Grandma Anna was dragged to Terezin or Terezin stop. She perished there. My wonderful cousin, Peter Hans, was dragged to Terezin and then was on one of the last transports to Auschwitz and he was murdered there. Um, Vali, Vali um, the beautiful lady in back of Peter, um, died in Terezin. This is my cousin Peter. And um, see, who did I leave out? Yeah. Oh, um, I had a wonderful cousin, Uncle Leo, my father's brother. And he made it to England. He was a doctor. The English would not let him be a doctor because he had not been gone, gone through their system. And um, they made him um, work farm machinery on the farm. This doctor knew nothing about farm machinery. So he crashed it into a ditch. He broke his wrists and there was no one there to set it properly. He um, knew that he could never be a surgeon, doctor again. His um, lady friend who he was very close to left him because he was Jewish and he took his own life. It was very, very sad. Okay. And Susie, when, when the war was over, how old were you when you came to the United States? I was eight years old. Mm -hmm. And where, where was the first place that you arrived in the United States? Where, or where did you um, settle once you came? Um, we, we took a, a boat, uh, a, we were in a convoy of 80, and um, we, we, got, we went up, through the, up the Atlantic, and we landed in New York. And um, we had a cousin of my father's who met us, and they were very anxious to give us all these foods that we hadn't seen for so very long. And we, we did eat the oranges, the apples, and all the wonderful things and became very, very ill because up until now we had lived on very sparse things because even when we lived in England, um, most of the food was going to the war effort and you lived off your garden and or the few rations. The rations were powdered milk, powdered eggs, like that. And we survived on it. But our, our um, stomachs weren't used to regular food, and um, we were we were ill with that. And, we came to Seattle. and then we came to Cecil. <laughs> it was Seattle, but we called it Cecil. <laughs> and then we we didn't get off at the right place and went up to Bellingham, and then came back around and um, started our life. And my dad with twenty five dollars, minus the food that we spent in New York. <laughs> Hmm. Well, as we're nearing the end of the program here, I have one last question, and this is really for all of you. And Henry, you've talked about this a bit, but please feel free to expand um, or talk more about it. And that is, what do you want people to learn from your story from the Holocaust? Um, first of all, I would say how very lucky we are to live in America. And um, my mother, Amy Rindler, always told me the importance of education because they can't take away from you what you know. And that certainly made a big difference in my life. And also, we should never, ever forget the families and all people who were so brutally killed in the Holocaust. Always remember and honor. Mm -hmm. How about you, Pete? As I've had the privilege for 23 years to tell my story, 
predominantly to youngsters. I always try to make an uh, attempt to let them know that behind this story, which is very new, sometimes never heard of by some of the kids that are listening, but that there were human beings behind all this. And I tell it as my personal experience, it is based on the truth, to clear up falsehoods, misinformation, and to create awareness of what mankind is capable of doing to itself. Uh, I try to create an awareness of certain similarities of today to the conditions which led to the past. I encourage truth and above all, independent thought. Thank you, Pete. Henry? You know, when we talk about 6 million people that died, it's a number. But just to give you an example, of why life is so precious, why the loss is not just the 6 million people. The teacher that my father brought with us that survived, she went to Israel. She got married to an engineer. They had one daughter. Her name is Malcolm. I just had a call from her because we talked to each other. Even though she was in Israel, I'm over here. Her mother is gone. Her father started an engineering firm, employs 150 people. Malke had three children, two sons and a daughter. She has now 10 grandchildren. So from this one lady, if she would be alive today, there would be 10 great grandchildren. So when we talk millions, take about each person that passed what the world has lost by the six million. This is the lesson that we must learn in order to avoid something like this. Again, I keep saying, teach the Holocaust because you can learn so much from each survivor that has gone, that has survived, and what they have done with their lives. Because life is precious. Never, never give up hope. Never, never give up hope. I was accused of being a dreamer when I said I want a Holocaust Museum in Seattle. And everybody said, it's impossible. But look, it is happening. It isn't as big as I had the vision, but I settled for less. But it's a learning center. It's a foundation for future generations to build on. So thank you, Seattle, for giving me the opportunity to start a new life and raise a family. Henry, the museum is growing and growing. We'll get there. <laughs> um, Susie, Pete, and Henry, I'm so honored to have this opportunity to talk with all of you today on Holocaust Remembrance Day. And I know I speak for so many people when I tell you that you have changed my life. Your stories and your experiences and just you all have changed the way I see the world and the way I exist in the world. So I really wanna thank you for sharing these stories with me and with all of us today. It means a lot to all of us. So before we move to a beautiful closing blessing with Rabbi Benziken, I wanna take a moment to thank our entire team at the Holocaust Center Nowhere will you find a more passionate and dedicated group of individuals who work so hard to preserve and share the stories and lessons of the Holocaust. These programs are truly a team effort and everyone had a part in making this happen. And I could not dream of a better group of people to work with. Thank you to Richard Green for running the technical side of this show and making it all so seamless. Thank you to our incredible CEO, D. Simon. I'm thinking of your mom, Frida Suri today. Ali Laps, who put together the wonderful video you saw at the beginning of the program. Lori Werschel Cohen, our resident historian and consultant. Julia Thompson, who runs our Speakers Bureau and works closely with the survivors and artifacts. And Amanda Davis, Paul Regelbrug, Morgan Romero, Katie Lawrence, and welcome to our new Director of Development, 
Jessica Michaels. Rabbi Benzikin, it's been an honor to have you as part of our program today. I'll turn it back over to you to close our program on this Yom HaShoah 2022. El Mole Rahami Uit Mole Rahama Vamerubim Al Nefashot Ruchot Un Shamo Bemalat Kedoshimutorim Vegiborim Keduara Rakia Maziri Lenishmot אחינו הקדושים, ששת מיליוני היהודים, חללי השואה במלחמת עולם השנייה באירופה, שנהרגו, שנשחטו ושנטרפו, ושניצפו על קידוש השם בידי המרצחים, הגרמנים הנאצים ועוזריהם, משאר העמים, יימח שמם לכן, בעל הרחמים והצליחות אסירם בסתר כנפיך לעולמי. צל שדי יתלוננו ולקץ הימים תעמידם ומנחל עד עניך תשכם וצרור בצרור החיים את נשמותיהם ותשים כבוד מנוחתם ותלווה עליהם השלום חיים בהם מקרא שכתוב ונכחה אדוני תמיד, והשביע בצעת אחד נפשך ועצמותך יחליץ, והיית כחרה וכמות שמיים, אשר לא יחזבו ממיו. אדוני הוא נחלתם בגן עדן, תהם מנוחתם, ויעמדו לגורתם לקץ הימים. Venomar Amen. God full of mercy who dwelt in the heights, provide a sure rest upon the divine presence wing within the range of the holy and the pure, whose shining resemble the skies, or the soul of all our holy brethren, the six million of our Jewish brothers and sisters, victim of the European Holocaust, who were murdered, slaughtered, burned terminated for the sanctification of your name by the German Nazi assassin and their cohort accomplices and helpers from other nations of the world. And all those who have been targeted by the Nazis, the reform master of the mercy, protect them forever from behind the secret of your wings and tie their soul within the bound, the bond of life eternal. May the everlasting be their heritage, and the Garden of Eden be their resting place, and they shall rest peacefully upon their couch. They will stand for their fate in the end of days, and let us say, Amen.